I was, I'm the daughter of Indian immigrants brought up in eastern North Carolina. I am um, the product of my, my, of course, my parents, but um, my, my dad is an electrical engineer, my mom an entrepreneur, and I was destined to become a doctor, and I thought that was going to be the route I take. I was a science fair junkie when I, when I was starting at 12 years old, working in scientific laboratories. And I published my first paper, scientific paper, when I was uh, 16 years old, and majored in neuroscience in college. But I received a fellowship when I graduated to give me the opportunity to travel from Thailand to Pakistan for a year. I had wonderful professors who said to me, if you want to understand people's motivations, aspirations, get a backpack and start traveling for a year. I was 22 years old, and I did that. And it was in India, where my parents are from. I was coming off a train station, and I saw 50 kids sitting in a circle learning how to read and write. These children obviously were poor and destitute. And I spoke Hindi, my friend spoke Oriya, the, the, the local language, and we asked what was going on with that teacher right there. And she said, these children live on and around the train platform. They work, they play, they beg, they sleep, they eat, but they don't go to school. And that, that's one of those young kids, you know, working on a train platform. But what ended up happening was a teacher named Inderjeet Karana came on the train platform every day and saw these kids. And she said, you know, if these kids can't go to school, I'm going to bring the school to the train platform. And I asked her, I asked this teacher, I said, that's really cool. How much does it cost to run one of these schools? And at that time, it cost about $400 to educate 50 kids with a hot meal every day. And I also asked, how come I don't see more train platform schools all over India? And the teacher said, well, this social entrepreneur, Inderjeet Karana, wants to make that happen. And it was there that I had my moment of obligation. I decided not to go get my MD, PhD. I decided to found the Global Fund for Children. The Global Fund for Children invests small amounts of philanthropic capital into very innovative grassroots organizations serving the most vulnerable children and youth in the world. I founded the organization when I was 24 years old. And I received seed capital to start it. I think the folks that gave me my first um, uh, investments thought that I had enormous hallucinogenic optimism. <laughs> and, and I decided, you know, there was nothing to lose and everything to gain because there were thousands of Inderjeet Karanas in the world who were founding very innovative local organizations serving the most vulnerable. So I, took, I went on a journey for 17 years. And one of those is in Afghanistan. In the 1990s, the Taliban had made education for girls illegal. If you were caught educating a girl, you could be stoned to death, killed. There was an extraordinary social entrepreneur named Sakina Akubi, who was going from Peshawar, Pakistan, to Kabul, Afghanistan, teaching women and teachers how to teach girls secretly. I remember meeting Sakina, and she said, I need $5,000 
to teach girls secretly, a thousand girls. And I said, well, the Global Fund for Children will back you. Fast forward today, the Afghan Institute of Learning serves and provides health and education to 450,000 women and children in Afghanistan. We at the Global Fund for Children take a little bit of pride in the fact that we were able to support Sakina's work at the very beginning. Here in Bangladesh, there's a young man named Razwan. He lives on the waterways of Bangladesh. He went to the University of Dhaka. And he was very concerned that many of the waterways in Bangladesh were becoming flooded because of climate change and children were not being able to go to school. We came across one of his boats, called school boats. They, they go from, from village to village educating children. They are um, uh, powered by solar pa panels. The Global Fund for Children took a bet on Rezwan, and we gave him a grant to go from one boat, five boats. We gave him a $10,000 investment, and he went and made it happen. But what was even better is five years later, his organization got a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, Excellence in Learning Award for $1 million that allowed him to replicate these boat schools throughout Bangladesh. We take great pride, again, in Rezwan's moment of obligation in helping to support him. And we go to Cambodia, the group called Kasaro, a young man who founded this organization. He was um, the victim. He, was, he, was, um, he escaped from Pol Pot. He decided to come back because he had an obligation to give back. And he works with children who work at the garbage dumps and their families. These kids do not go to school. They are doing hazardous labor. So he created these mobile health clinic and vans that go by the garbage dumps and provide health training, give the necessary first aid, but also they get to go to school. All of these examples I want to multiply. Because what we were able to do has been able to invest in nearly 700 of these organizations throughout the world, investing nearly $40 million and touching the lives of nearly 10 million children. I'm a founder. And you know, I thought pretty seriously that I could do this for the rest of my life. But something happened at the 15-year mark where I started thinking, you know, it's better if someone else comes and takes over the Global Fund for Children. It's probably the hardest thing I've ever done um, in my career of letting go of something, but it was the right thing to do because it opened up a whole new journey for me. Remember when I told you that I um, was a science fair junkie? I did science as a kid. That was what I was destined to do, was become a scientist. Well, after I left the Global Fund for Children, and I was on sabbatical at, um, at Johns Hopkins, I was approached to become the CEO and president of the Society for Science and the Public. And the Society for Science and the Public is best known to inform, educate, and inspire all people about scientific advancements. We're best known for our world-class science competitions for young people, young innovators who are anywhere from the age of 14 to 21 who are using science and engineering to solve the world's most intractable problems. Meet Sahiti. She lives in Bangalore. 
She's 17 years old. Her moment of obligation occurred when she saw a fire in, the, in, in Bangalore on, on a lake. And she was very concerned about the pollutants that were across all of these lakes in Bangalore. So she created a crowdsourcing platform using a testing strip that would test the waters of whether pollutants were there or not. She's using citizen science now to scale this throughout the world, that they can use this app and this testing strip and, and collect data about fresh water, fresh water lakes throughout the world. Think about that. She's only 17 years old. And then there's Nuha. She's also 16 years old. She's from Indonesia. She lives on the island of Banga. She, where she lives, is the second largest uh, tin industry, tin ore industry in the world. She started seeing freshwater fish and coral reef dying. So she, as an engineering student, created this filter, which would take effluents or water waste and clean that water so fresh, fresh fish and reefs can grow again. She actually is taking this prototype to market and working with some of these companies to say, yes, it's important for this mining to happen for our industry, but at least let's do it properly. And here's Emily. Emily's from here in the United States. And she, her moment of obligation happened when her father, a firefighter, introduced her to children who were burn victims. And she was so taken by, by their pain, she said, we have to do something. So she went into a scientific laboratory and found a new way of using a protein that would help regenerate cells, cells for burn victims. She's only 15, 16 years old. You know, there's, there's um, a famous quote from Steve Jobs at his Stanford University speech, where he says, you cannot connect the dots looking forward, but you can connect the dots looking backwards. And for me, being the founder of the Global Fund for Children, and now the CEO and president of the Society for Science and the Public, and working with young innovators throughout the world who are solving the world's most intractable problems, those dots fit perfectly. But what has been pushing me has been this obligation, moments of obligation. And each one of the, these individuals that you've met today have had these obligations coming from very, very important places, from their own backyards to their own family histories. So I leave you here today asking you what your moment of obligation is. What do you think that you think that you can do to make the world a better place. Thank you.